list, so we are ready to get started. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Democratizing Analytics with Cloud Native Data Warehouses on Kubernetes. I'm Valerie Lancy. I'm a Cloud Infrastructure Engineer at Lyft, and I'm a Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be your moderator for today, and I'd like to welcome our presenters, Robert Hodges, CEO at Altinity, and Vladislav Kamenko, Senior Software Engineer at Altinity. Great. Thank you very much, Valerie. We're delighted to be here today. Um, we'd also like to thank the Cloud Native Computing Foundation for putting on this event. It's just a real pleasure to share the work that we've been doing uh, both on Kubernetes as well as data warehouses and putting these two things together. So I'm going to dive in, just give you a little bit more color about our backgrounds. I'm CEO of Altinity. Our uh, business is to offer services and support for ClickHouse, which is a very popular uh, open source data warehouse. We'll talk very briefly about how that data warehouse works to give you some background. For the purposes of this talk, the relevant part of my background is I'm also a database geek. I've been working with databases since 1983, uh, have worked at various different levels with over 20 uh, database types, and I've been working on Kubernetes since 2018. Vlad is, uh, as Valerie mentioned, a senior software engineer at Altinity. He has over 15 years of database and application experience, and most importantly for this talk, he is the main designer of the ClickHouse Kubernetes operator, which is our, the main focus in this presentation. What I'd like to do is just take a couple of minutes and introduce ClickHouse to level set, because I suspect that not everybody on this call is a data warehouse specialist or, or even deeply involved in data. So ClickHouse is an open source data warehouse. And the simplest way to explain this, if you have any experience with databases, is to think that we combined MySQL, which is a very popular open source database, and Vertica, which is a very popular open, a very popular proprietary data warehouse, and conceptually, ClickHouse is their child. So it doesn't owe core, uh, uh, it doesn't inherit code from either of them, but it has many of the ideas that are present in these two products. So, for example, both from MySQL as a relational database and Vertica as a column store, it speaks SQL. From the MySQL side. Uh, very portable, runs on bare metal to cloud. From the Vertica side, it has a shared nothing architecture. That is to say, there's a bunch of nodes. They each have attached storage and, and uh, with closely connected compute. They talk to each other through a network. From the Vertica side, we, sure, we store the data in columns. So you can think of that as having the data arranged in a bunch of arrays. And every time you touch the data, you're reading it sequentially down the column or you're writing it sequentially, again, down the column. So this, this is optimized, it helps you optimize your I.O. Again, from the data warehouse and Vertica side, we have parallel and vectorized execution. By vectorized in, uh, uh, execution, we mean the ability to break up these columns into pieces, uh, efficiently farm them out to all the available CPUs and, and cores on those CPUs, and use things like SIMD instructions to get the maximum speed of, of execution. We also parallel ver parallelize very well across many nodes. <clears throat> the database runs on everything from a laptop, which I'm running right here with Ubuntu, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, all the way up to clusters that include hundreds of nodes and petabytes of data. And uh, finally, it's open source. It's an Apache license, so same license as we have for most products in, in or in projects inside the Cloud Native uh, Computing Corporation. And one final note: it's really fast. So if you you know if you're into data, it's a it's an interesting uh, data warehouse to look at. And one of the things that we have been very interested in, of course, is bringing this to Kubernetes and preserving all these qualities. Now. As we begin to look at this for Kubernetes, it's also useful to think about what kind of application does this really look like on the ground? And what's particularly relevant for uh, Kubernetes <coughs> is that ClickHouse is also a distributed application. And of course, Kubernetes supports distributed applications very well. So a typical application would look like uh, the slide that we're showing right now. We will have data sharded. So a shard is a subset of data. 
and we'll have data replicated. So what you see here, the uh, shard one is replicated across multiple servers. Shard two is replicated across another servers. The replicas are spread across availability zones. And then when people run queries, there are ways that you can actually run the query and have it automatically hit all the shards uh, the, um, and, and then aggregate the results and hand them back to you. We also have Zookeeper. <clears throat> which is used since this is a distributed uh, system and there is some state where everybody has to have consensus about what is going on in the data warehouse, like what is the list of things that need to be replicated. We use Zoo Zookeeper to store that date, that state. So this is actually an application that it is beneficial to have it on Kubernetes, but at the same time, we benefit from having the support in Kubernetes to support it, to, to run this kind of distributed application. So what I'm now going to do is, given that background, I'm going to go ahead and dive in and talk a little bit about what this looks like when we're actually building a cloud-native uh, data warehouse, what this looks like from a user. So the first thing is that even though I can say lightly that it's great to move Onto, to move this onto Kubernetes and how, because Kubernetes has all these great features, but the fact of the matter is that when you're actually running on Kubernetes, as many of you know, Kubernetes itself is, has, has, a lot, has a rich set of resources. The application that we're bringing onto Kubernetes is, has many moving parts as well. So what we get is a relatively complex set of resources which have to be which we have to stand up and manage on kubernetes so this is a problem if we had to just write a bunch of deployment files and hand code this this would be very very difficult to even get it to run in the first place and then of course to make any changes upgrades um, adding things to the system, taking things away, of course, this would be very difficult to do, even in even if we scripted it um, uh, using something like helm. So what we do instead is we use one of the new features in Kubernetes, which is called an operator. And they are specifically designed to help encapsulate these kinds of complex deployments. And the key thing that the operator does is it creates a, what we call a custom resource definition, which contains all the information that is necessary to stand up the cluster. And that uh, custom resource definition can be loaded into Kubernetes. It uh, has a specific, uh, it becomes a new resource type when we install the operator. And then the operator, when, it's, uh, when it sees this, will look at the specification and then take appropriate steps to create all the resources like pods, stateful sets, uh, uh, persistent volume claims, all those kinds of things that are necessary to have the ClickHouse actually run, uh, actually run in Kubernetes. It not only takes care of setting up the resources, but it also does what we call a best practice deployment. So um, it's one thing to set up pods, but of course within the pods you need to have configuration files, you need to handle schema correctly, you need to set buttons and knobs uh, correctly to run in the environment uh, that you're in, you need to add users. These are additional things on top of the basic resource management that the operator is capable of doing. So operators, um, this is nothing unique, of course, to, uh, to ClickHouse and data warehouses. These have actually become very popular as a way of, of managing any type of application that has state, and there, there are now dozens of them available. So that's what, um, and a lot of our work then, of course, has been to implement this operator and then use it to stand up uh, data warehouses. Now, <clears throat> when you're installing an operator, it's quite simple, and these are I won't belabor these commands, but we basically just grab an installation file, which contains a bunch of parameters that define the operator as well as the uh, custom resource definition. That file I'm just pulling from Git. We can go ahead and apply that file, and then it pops up. The, the operator is encapsulated in a container. It's actually just a pod that can accept commands. Um, we normally install into the cube system namespace. Um, it pops up and then you're ready to go. And when you're done, you can just do a delete and take the operator away. So it's very uh, relatively simple to manage and bringing it up takes just a few seconds. 
when you're working with ClickHouse, you also need Zookeeper. As I mentioned in the introduction to ClickHouse, that's used to store the state where we need consensus across nodes. So um, there's a variety of ways to set up Zookeeper. It has its own operator right now. For demo purposes, I tend to use Helm. Um, there's a pretty good uh, chart for Helm under Incubator Zookeeper, which will just pop one up for you very quickly and uh, have something ready to run in about a minute. So you'll when you're when you're actually using ClickHouse, in, in you'll do these two steps. You'll install the operator. You'll set up at least one Zookeeper cluster, and then at that point, you're ready to begin adding data warehouses. So what I'd like to do now is briefly look at what this custom resource definition looks like. And the idea here is that instead of having 25 or so different files that define all the stateful sets, pods, and everything like that, we have a single file, and we want to make the top-level decisions in this file as simple as possible. So this is what a typical uh, ClickHouse installation resource looks like. So we have a name, for example. The clusters are all going to have CNCF in the name. We're going to define what are called clusters, which are basically layouts of, of, um, of data inside the data warehouse. We have one called uh, replicated in this case. And then we're going to give some simple directions of how many shards would we like to have and how many replicas on each of those shards. <clears throat> and then finally, we have a little bit of information about how to find Zookeeper. What this is doing is pointing to the Zookeeper service, which will then is actually a load balancer that has three underlying nodes. So this is the top level, and for, for very simple configurations, you don't have to add much more data than this. Now, in a real production data warehouse, of course, you need to have much more information. You need to have configuration data. You need to have users. So there are additional sections in the ClickHouse installation resource file where you can do things like add users. And this is an example <clears throat> of how we would add a local user that will then be created on each of these nodes. The user is called demo. Um, it has a password uh, uh, demo and some other things like which networks can access, uh, which quota it uses, stuff like that. So that's as simple as just adding this information. And actually what we can do is with the resource files, you don't have to make these decisions up front. You can set the, stand the data warehouse up, you can add this later, apply the file, and then it'll automatically go out and add those users. And then finally, we make use of templates. One of the ways that you get simplicity in systems is you want to have some way of expressing defaults. We do that through what we call templates. So for example, we have volume claim templates, which give you give direction about how to lay out storage. The specs for these are largely uh, similar to, uh, uh, to a persistent volume claim. We have pod templates, again, which allow us to specify the version of, uh, of the pod and other interesting information about that process. <clears throat> One thing I'll point out, which we'll bring up a little bit later, is that storage is a really interesting question, obviously. We're dealing with data. And one of the key problems that you have when you're setting up any kind of system on Kubernetes that involves data is you have to be very careful about uh, configuring your storage, because otherwise you will either not get what you want, or you may actually set up configurations where you can lose data quite easily. So this is something that, that we'll stress a little bit in this talk as we go forward. And then finally, one of the nice things is in addition to making configuration changes and adding and subtracting users, we can quickly scale up and scale down by modifying the layout. So for example, <clears throat> if I wanted to take that previous layout, which had um, you know X number of shards, Y number of replicas, if I want to now give it, make it three shards and three replicas, all I have to do is change these numbers, reapply the file, and the operator, when it receives it, will figure out the difference and take appropriate steps to increase the scope of the resources that are allocated to the, to the data warehouse. So this has been kind of dry code. What I'd like to do at this point is just show you how this works. Because one of the things that's really great about Kubernetes and, and, and I think gives 
where we feel a lot of optimism about how well this is going to work is Kubernetes allows you to do these operations very quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, for those of you who know Rocky and Bullwinkle, this is the famous nothing up my sleeve line. So what we're going to do is go over to a cluster that is running in Amazon and go ahead and set up the, uh, uh, the uh, system. So let me just make sure that things are completely clean. We'll you're all familiar with the kube uh, cuddle command. So we'll do kube cuddle get all. Just make sure there's nothing in the environment other than the uh, Kubernetes IP address. Going to make absolutely sure they don't have any storage left over from previous demos. So get PVC. Um, nothing out there. Great. We're ready to go. Let's do the following. I wanted to show you this, this file that we have. So it's very similar to what we just showed you in the slides. We have our ZooKeeper configuration. We have a cluster, it has a layout. It's just going to start with one shard and one replica. Um, we have defined um, users, and then we have some templates just as we discussed uh, earlier on. So this is the file. It's not particularly complex, but this is all that's necessary to create a relatively um, powerful data warehouse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to apply that file. So let's go ahead and apply it. And what we're going to want to do is just keep an eye on run a watch command. And let's just keep an eye on what's going on inside the cluster as this comes up. So what you can see here is we've already created a stateful set to, uh, 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 to manage this cluster. We actually create one per pod uh, for reasons that we'll discuss in a minute. We've created, a because this is running on Amazon, we've created an internal load balancer. So you can see that if you're, this is a COPS cluster, by the way. So if you run COPS, this, some of this stuff is going to look pretty familiar. And then we have the pod, which is already up and running. So this is one of the really uh, things that I really like about Kubernetes. I, uh, I started working at Kubernetes at VMware. I was working, uh, uh, used to working on VMs. Kubernetes is really fast, as particularly if, um, if you're doing sort of demo test type things. So um, that cluster is already up and ready to go. Let's go ahead and log into it. And so I've gone and exec using kubectl exec. I've now connected to the pod. I'm actually inside it. And I'm going to see if I can connect to the cluster. And there we are. <clears throat> I'm connected in. I'll do a show tables. This is if you're a SQL person, if, particularly if you know MySQL, this is going to look very familiar. I'm just checking to see what tables are available. And what I'm going to do is just go ahead and create a table. This is going to be a replicated table, so I'm going to copy in the table definition. Boom, I've just created a replicated table, but I only have one replica, so it's a bit boring. I'm also going to add a little bit of data into it. So let's go ahead and add one line of data. Again, very trivial example, but quick. And if I select it back, <clears throat> there it is. My one row of data just came back from my replicated table. Let's quit out of this, and what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to scale this cluster up and add another, or, uh, add an additional replica to it. Get fully out of the pod, and I'm now going to make a very small change to that re custom resource definition that we described. Let's just go ahead and diff it. I'm just going to change the replicas count, which was in there, from one to two. That's all I'm going to do. And what I'm now going to do is apply that file. So let's go ahead and do a, an apply. And we'll watch as this comes up. And what we see is the existing cluster is, uh, the existing pod continues to run. We see there's a second stateful set here. And now what we have, uh, what's, what's happening is we're basically firing up the, um, firing up the pod, creating the container so on and so forth. We'll give that a second or two to finish. I want to just look at a couple of, uh, just show a couple of other things which are interesting when you're, when you're working on these systems. It's always important when you're dealing with data to have a quick look and make sure that the PVCs are correctly created. So those are the persistent volume claims that then cause storage to be allocated. So let's, let's look at the PVCs. Sure enough, we see that there are two of them. They're bound. They have volumes that they correspond to. We can go ahead and check that the volumes are um, created. 
we actually have five volumes here. Three of them are used for Zookeeper, which was already set up. So basically, this cluster is is up. We see the storage has been allocated and correctly bound. That's that's always if you're paranoid and if you deal with data, you're always paranoid. So it's good to see this. And what I now like to do is that pod should be up. So let's go ahead and we'll quickly jump into it. Let's just do a get all. Make sure the system is fully up there. It's running. It's it's fully up and running. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and exec into the second pod because this is a replica, and what I am going to expect to see there is it's actually already set up that data that we created in the first pod. So let's go ahead and exec into this using kubectl exec. Here we are, and we'll connect to the server. So let's do, okay, ta-da, we're going to do show tables. And we don't have a table yet. Aha, this is great. This, of course, worked beautifully. Let's just see if it needs a minute or two more to... Uh, interesting. Okay. Just a second here. Ah, okay. This, of course, in every single demo, there's some, it looks like it's uh, briefly hung up here in every single demo uh, preparation that I did before. Of course, it correctly replicated across and I was able to, um, to view the data. Let's just do a show databases. Let's see if there's any other problem here. Nope, default, show tables. Okay, it's not replicating across. Um, every now and then demos don't quite work right, um, so this seems to be one of them. But um, normally what you would see if, uh, you know, if we weren't having some sort of uh, mild system problem here, is you would see this table replicate across, including the data. That's something that we we correctly uh, sync the uh, the clusters and ensure that they can talk to each other. I think some um, it's possible because of uh, multiple rehearsals of this, I've screwed something up in the system, and you're not seeing it here today. <clears throat> Let's just assume though that I'll debug that and um, be able to get that working shortly. I'd like to show you one other small thing, which is how we upgrade these systems. And that's very simple. So what we can do is I'm going to go ahead and, um, oops, in the wrong place. Let's go ahead and let's just run the upgrade. So what we're going to do is make a very small change where we're going to switch the templates for the pods. And we're going to go from running ClickHouse version 19.6 to 20.1. That's the only, I have separate pod definitions, uh, two, two different templates. Just by switching the templates and then applying the definition, I can then cause this to come up and, and run. So we go ahead and run the upgrade. And we're going to watch. And what's, what you'll see here is, and we won't wait for this to run because it'll take a it'll take a couple minutes. What it's actually doing is going ahead and terminating pods, recreating the the clusters, attaching them to the storage, and then bringing them back up again. So basically, you get a new version of each pod. And and um, uh, you know, once this process is done, in the meantime. Uh, we designed this so that the pods, so the, the data warehouse stays up and then is able to, uh, uh, you know, it, and users are able to continue use, uh, accessing it while this is going on. So that's it for the demo. Let's go ahead and switch back to the slides. And I'll bring this up. And at this point, what I'd like to do is go ahead and invite. Um, Vlad, uh, uh, Vlad Klemenko to join us and talk about what's going on inside the operator that helps these operations uh, uh, complete successfully in most cases. So Vlad, over to you. Hello everyone. So let's dive deeper and take a look on how operator actually works and what does it do? So how it communicates with Kubernetes and how it builds the ClickHouse cluster from from this uh, YAML definition file. So let's take a look into this slide. And um, here we see the communication between 
major parts involved in this process. So all things starts from ClickHouse resource definition. This is blue file that you can see on the left side. And here is this YAML file that we've just walked around. And so you provide this ClickHouse storm resource definition through kubectl apply and it just jumps through Kubernetes API into etcd database. Actually, inside this etcd database, there are definitions of all objects that are used by Kubernetes that are really created. And uh, Kubernetes handles with native controllers all resources known to, to Kubernetes. So when you create a pod or a stateful set or a service, there are native Kubernetes controllers which know how to deal with these type of resources. But then all of a sudden there is a new type of resource, this click house resource definition, this new type of resource. And kubectl apply, it just puts this new resource description into etcd. And here we can see it in yellow that there is a custom resource, click house installation. And Kubernetes by itself has no idea on how to deal with this kind of resource. So what it does, Kubernetes by itself, it places this custom resource into etcd with hopes that there would be a custom controller that could handle all these custom resources and actually materialize this custom resource into what would be a ClickHouse cluster. And this controller is a ClickHouse operator. So here it is in bottom right corner and ClickHouse operator is actually a custom resource controller. So ClickHouse operator knows how to deal with custom resources. And the uh, operator communicates with Kubernetes again through API bidirectionally. From Kubernetes API, ClickHouse gets some events, notifications about changes, new resources that have come, and ClickHouse operator can do actions towards Kubernetes API, such as create new resources, instantiate new types of what, what needed to be made to make ClickHouse cluster. So actually we can see that out of this available blocks, ClickHouse operator can create an actual ClickHouse cluster. So these, all of these uh, parts are made of like uh, ClickHouse custom resource definition. And let's take a look on in more details what part of this custom resource definition can be made are available in our YAML files. So there are five main parts that create ClickHouse installation specification. First of all, it's like a default. So in this part, you can describe global defaults that will be used all over the ClickHouse installation. Second part is configuration. This is the big part where you specify cluster topology, zookeeper locations, all other custom specifics like uh, custom co configuration files for ClickHouse, custom configuration files for environment. And there are three other parts that specify templates used by the ClickHouse installation. First is like service templates. This uh, template set used to instantiate services. Then it comes pod templates and the operator instantiate pods out of these templates. So they, there is uh, three steps to instantiate a pod. First of all, we have these pod templates, then they are applied to build a stateful set. So actually ClickHouse operator manipulates pod through stateful sets and ClickHouse operator makes a stateful set based on these pod templates specified. And the third part is storage claim templates. So up again to this stateful set, storage is bound through storage claim templates. And thus we have like stateful sets which can operate with pods, can operate with persistent volumes, and also we have services available. And all of these parts actually are bricks out of which ClickHouse cluster is built. And um, <clears throat> let's move a little bit further and take a look on how actual cluster can look like. Uh, main idea is that uh, ClickHouse by itself is under a very active development right now. So new versions are coming and um, also sometimes you need to build a cluster out of like a commodity hardware that you have and very often you have different hardware servers or you have different like ClickHouse versions running simultaneously on your cluster. So that's why 
there is like um, different variety of all parts of hardware and uh, and software that can be comprised the cluster the whole cluster and also there is another another notion because clickhouse is under active development there are new versions coming and coming all the way and you will need to have a canary test so you can set up a new clickhouse version and take a look on how this particular version performs in new cluster so actually uh, we should split like uh, notion of healthy node in terms of kubernetes and healthy node in terms of clickhouse and your like business aims for example you may have a node that need some weeks to run before we can safely name it like ready for real production usage because for example in real life there are like different business scenarios and you may want to run this new version of clickhouse through all business business uh, scenarios and that you may use it for for example maybe once per week you have a like grand uh, report built for your data analytics department or maybe like any action by weekly is launched this is all very business specific for your particular task but from clickhouse cluster point of view and kubernetes point of view this means that you have to have cluster made out of different versions of clickhouse and different for different hardware that's why we are moving on the next part so actually clickhouse operator treats like one per pod per stateful set so actually we have as many stateful sets as there would be like clickhouse instances and we have often been asked why this approach is used and main idea is that stateful set is very good of course you can like bundle all the same replicas into one stateful set but the stateful set has some limitations about that we definitely need to have different versions of clickhouse software running at the same time in the cluster that's why that's one starting point the other state st start the other point is that we need to spread this cluster over boundaries of availability zones so we have to have a completely distributed system and uh, taking in, uh, into consideration that we have to have this system running of different versions of software with different sets of uh, persistent volumes of different storage applied and also running on over multiple availability zones we decided that we would go with not picking all pods into one stateful set but through this approach when we have one stateful set and one click house instant running in each personal stateful set so okay so let's move on and take a look on how actually operator operates so what actions it performs so first of all we have new click house resource definition coming into operator so this click house resource definition passed through kubectl through kubernetes api then through etcd and again it finally lands in click house operator and now click house operator has to compare this new resource definition this is actual state that should be achieved and current resource definition so what we actually have in the moment in our clickhouse cluster and then the main idea is that clickhouse operator builds action plan so what actions should be done to move our clickhouse cluster from current state to the desired state to the state that end user want clickhouse to be in and there we have an action plan and having this action plan clickhouse operator starts moving step by step one pod at a time so actually we are trying to minimize downtime of all pods that's why one pod at a time clickhouse operator st starts rebuilding those stateful sets remounting those data volumes and finally when we have these like sequential pods upgrade completed we will have new state of the cluster now let's move to the next slide and take a look into another like uh, area so 
the cluster upgrade it's a complex procedure so it involves three parties clickhouse operator kubernetes itself and clickhouse so actually for example if we are adding a new replica to the cluster definition all three parts would be involved into this procedure in adding a new replica and let's take a look on how exactly it, it, it um, but first of all clickhouse operator it receives these request for a new YAML specification with a request to add replica. So after building this action plan, ClickHouse operator understands that, okay, we need to add new replica. So ClickHouse operator process this add new replica request. Actually, ClickHouse instructs Kubernetes what object should be launched, what object should be created, like stateful set, spot, persistent volume claims, config maps. So ClickHouse operator requests Kubernetes to instantiate all objects that are required for this new replica. Then when we have these all parts up and running, ClickHouse by itself starts to boot. So first step, we have this ClickHouse instance running, but it's not yet included into cluster. Here ClickHouse operator moves on. So next step, ClickHouse operator can configure monitoring because we need, we won't like to monitor all this cluster. But we'll talk about monitoring a little bit later in more details. Third part, send schema to all new replica nodes. So actually ClickHouse operator add tables and adds specification what cluster to join. And at this point, ClickHouse new instance of ClickHouse sees these distributed tables and actually it can join cluster. So all three parties are involved and at the end of the section we have a new replica joined into the cluster. Now let's uh, take a deeper look inside this small rectangle about monitoring. Actually operator does not only install the ClickHouse, it, maintain, it tries to maintain its full life cycle, like install, upgrade, delete, and also one important part is monitoring. So actually ClickHouse operator completely encapsulates all the monitoring of the whole cluster, and ClickHouse operator provides one simple Prometheus endpoint to fetch all metrics from the whole cluster. Main idea is that a cluster is a dynamic entity. So you can add new replicas, you can add new like uh, shards, or maybe you can enlarge or shrink your cluster. And if uh, in most cases you need to add or remove new replicas from, from Prometheus. So for example, if you would like to enlarge your cluster and add new replicas, you have to add those replicas into Prometheus. But ClickHouse operator completely automates all this part because operator knows what replicas this cluster consists of. And that's why ClickHouse operator can completely encapsulate all this monitoring inside, inside, inside like a black box providing one single entry point. And this entry point can be used by Prometheus and then by Grafana, for example. The optimization and the automation is of hiding all these dynamics behind, behind the operator's back. So actually you will have one single point and all the monitoring, all metrics come through this end point. That's very good automation for monitoring and we are really like proud about implementation of this part. Okay, so let's take a couple, uh, another step and speak a little bit about storage. So actually with storage, we have options, what storage can be used. And generally operator can communicate with two general types of storage, cloud storage and local storage. Uh, in cloud storage, there are like options like Amazon or Google or any other cloud providers and strong sites like advantages. It's very simple to use cloud storage from Kubernetes or from ClickHouse operator. You just simply specify persistent volume claim template that you would like to use storage, persistent storage that big, and cloud storage will simply provide it for you. Downside is like this is network access and it's not as fast as it can possibly be. 
So in this case, if you're trying to squeeze all the performance that you may, can uh, achieve from this drive, from your storage system, you have to go with local storage. Actually, many ClickHouse operator users go with local storage. And here we have, again, some options. Because Kubernetes provides several local storage like templates to be used. And first of all, it's like empty dir. It's very simple to specify, very simple to use. It's as fast as local storage is. So no problem about that. But backside of this, it's durability. So empty dir local storage, it lasts as long as your pod lasts. That's not good enough. So actually, we are moving on to the next storage type. It's host path. Host path, it's like a storage type when you can specify a path to your local storage. And that's more like durable approach than empty dir. Actually, data written to this host path are durable as long as, as, uh, as this local path is available. So actually, that's good. But on the other side, it's very complex to how to manage all this part. Because main idea is that this is pass on your local drive. And all pods that are running on this node can actually write into this host path. And it's up to you or actually up to operator on how to set up all these parts so multiple instances will not collide and will not harm this data located into this host path. Actually, Kubernetes also is moving on and providing like a next level of subtraction. It's like storage class local, which actually is host path or with new some advantages about like simplifying usage of host pass. So these are main storage options. Actually, if you would like to go simple and like quick, you would like you would like to use cloud storage. If you would like to squeeze any performance you can achieve, go with local storage. And let's move on. So how to define what storage classes are available in cloud provider? First of all, you can simply ask your kubectl to describe all available storage classes. And you can see the set of storage classes provided by, by your cloud storage operator or your Kubernetes, which storage classes are configured. So, and you can simply bind to default storage or to some kind of specific storage in our like ClickHouse persistent volume claim template, you can request for particular storage type that you would like to deal with. Okay, let's move to the next slide. And the next slide would be about where would you like to place your data? So for example, you're going to build a, a distributed cluster that would keep some data in different availability zones. So you would like to have one replica in one availability zone and another replica in another availability zone. And ClickHouse operator handles these already. So you can specify two different templates for each specific replica. And you, for example, can specify that the first replica would use this template that would be located in 2A availability zone. And the other replica would use another template that tells to be in 2B availability zones. And ClickHouse operator has very convenient shortcuts on how to manage your location of your pods among different availability zones. Okay, also templates add additional portability. So it's much easier to manage your cluster when you have templates. So you do not change layout of the cluster. You simply can switch templates and go from test site, test cluster that can be run in Minikube within one node up to the real multi-availability zone deployment running over, spanning over several availability zones. And layout of the cluster will be the same. The only thing you are going to change is like template that is used in cluster specification. Well, there are plenty of stuff already done, but we already have a lot of stuff to be done in future. So what our roadmap, what would be the next steps to implement in ClickHouse operator? First of all, and uh, it's very, very well asked by many users, it's backup. So we are actively working on how to provide a convenient way to make a backup of the whole cluster. 
So another step is like, like reclaim storage. That's very interesting functionality as well. So when you would like to delete a cluster, but keep all storage intact and attach this already existing storage in a new cluster. That's very interesting functionality as well. So also we are working about ser with services, how to provide services in external or internal and per node access that can be done with services and last but not least security. Next big step, it's like proper certificate management across nodes and using encrypted storage. Well, I hope that we are, will be continuing very intensive development on ClickHouse Operator and implement all these items of our roadmap quite soon. Okay, now I will give a word to Robert. Thank you, everybody, and yeah. we'll talk about how to use Kubernetes. Thank, thank you so much, Vlad. And I just want to say there's some great questions coming up, I wasn't able to answer them fully because uh, I was actually making sure I had the slides moving properly for Vlad, but keep on uh, doing them. We've only got a couple more minutes to go and then we'll uh, dive in and answer questions because I think that this, uh, what you've seen so far uh, does raise some interesting issues. I want to talk about just one final issue in conclusion, which is the possibilities for using uh, Kubernetes to, to build analytics solutions. And this is really just a sketch. Um, this is, these are things that are going on right now, but I just want to give you a sense of what the possibilities are because we're very, very positive on, on how Kubernetes can help people combine analytics with their applications. So the first thing that you can get with Kubernetes is Kubernetes makes it very easy to build up applications from separate kinds of services. And uh, this is just an example of of, of a typical solution for analytics, which would include not just ClickHouse, but you'd have content sources, <coughs> you might have one or more Kafka consumers, you might be running a Spark um, machine learning pipeline to, uh, you know, to run ML on, on the data as it comes in from, um, uh, from Kafka and enhance it or um, or clean it up and then put it into ClickHouse. And then finally, you'd have Grafana, which is a great open source solution for dashboards. And the point here is that this is all fairly easy to set up inside Kubernetes, particularly as each of the data-related solutions has, uh, has, is increasingly run by, by operators. And um, that's important because real solutions at the business level for analytics are not just a data warehouse, but they're a data warehouse combined with other things. The fact that ClickHouse, or excuse me, that Kubernetes allows us to stand these up and connect them to each other uh, efficiently as well as securely is really important. So going forward, I think this is going to be a, um, is, is, this is clearly one of the big advantages of Kubernetes and, and one of the reasons why we want to be in that environment. There's a second advantage, which I think is actually bigger. Um, if you look at the history of data warehouses, they have traditionally been monoliths. Uh, the first uh, SQL data warehouses were systems like Teradata, which were not only monoliths, but actually ran on their own hardware that was then, so it was a completely integrated stack all the way up to pretty much the endpoint that, that user applications talk to. Uh, that has been broken down, of course, with virtualization and as people, you know, start to do less custom uh, hardware for, uh, for database and data warehouse solutions. But what's really important about Kubernetes is that you have a common set of resources and Kubernetes allows you to divide them up into pieces very efficiently. And what that means for data warehouses is instead of having these monoliths, we can now have individual data warehouses that are scaled and managed and configured for the application, for each individual application service. And this is, I call this sometimes breaking up the monolith, but it's a, I think it's a really important step forward in the evolution of data warehouse because it basically allows services to have analytics plugged into them, so high performance analytics plugged into them and run locally in the same way that we expect services to have their own copy of MySQL, their own copy of My MongoDB, their own copies of Redis that are encapsulated within the service. So this is, a, is another benefit and, and something that I think long term 
the combination of, of data warehouse on, on Kubernetes offers a lot of interesting possibilities for users. So just overall then, coming back to our original theme and title, we're interested in Kubernetes and we're, we're working on it because we do believe it democratizes data warehouse access. These are, we're, we see this as a way of providing data warehouse capabilities to applications that previously would not have considered them because they were too complex to manage or uneconomical. And the combination of having open source solutions as well as the ability to carve things up uh, really, uh, really opens up a lot of doors. And as you saw in the presentation, the operators are really key. This is just a, a really uh, enormously important innovation in the Kubernetes ecosystem. They allow us to do this data management effectively. And I think from the, the user uh, slides as well as, as Vlad's uh, description of the internals, you can really see how, this, how much it's actually doing. And of course, using the operator, then it, it, it is the key thing that then enables this ability to add these performance. Uh, these high performance analytics to any application. So with that, we're done. And um, we have a number of, Valerie, I don't know if there's any other extra things, but we have some open questions, which I'd like to, uh, uh, to cover. And if you have more questions, please uh, feel free to type them in and we'll gladly answer them. Um, yeah, it looks like we have just a few more minutes for questions. Great, okay, so we've got about seven minutes. Um, question here about sharding, which, uh, the <clears throat> yeah, and Vlad got a, gave a um, partial answer, but I'd really like to to to, to enlarge on that because um, <clears throat> it's an important aspect of the way ClickHouse works. So when we talk about shards, what we mean are effectively disjoint sets of data, and the way that ClickHouse works is that it it doesn't make any attempt to rebalance shards. So for example, if you're familiar with Cassandra. When you stick an extra node in the system, what Cassandra will do is it will automatically rebalance data so that there's, so the data is roughly is approximately evenly distributed across all the nodes available. ClickHouse does not do that, uh, at least for shards. So if you want to have the data moved, you actually have to move it. And this has pluses and minuses. The plus is you know what's going on. The minus is that you actually have to take pieces of the data, we call them parts, and one, one thing you can do is just copy them across and, um, you know, and, and it, you know, to the, so they arrive on the machines for a different shard and then delete them in the old one. But it's a manual process. You can, of course, script it. This is, as Vlad has uh, pointed out in one of his answers, this is something on our, on our to-do list, and actually it's, um, it's one of the biggest asks overall for the ClickHouse uh, community. Replicas, on the other hand, well, at least when the demos are working, all you have to do is when you add an additional replica, as long as the table schema is correctly created, it just automatically replicates uh, the data. So, um, so you do not have to do anything special to spread the data across the replicas when you add them. I hope that answers it. It's, it's sort of the way ClickHouse works now, and over time we expect this will be, um, uh, an will be uh, answered. Um, so here's another question that we didn't get to yet. Um, <clears throat> how does Kubernetes uh, handle ClickHouse high availability? So that that's a good question, and I think goes back to some of the things that we touched on. So ClickHouse, the fundamental way that ClickHouse handles uh, high availability is through replication. So the replication driven through Zookeeper, it's uh, we didn't do a lot of details on it, but it's basically a multi-master. Um, eventually consistent uh, replication scheme. You can go to any of the replicas, add data, and it will eventually, and usually pretty quickly, find its way to the other replicas. And um, so what you do is, this is, this is already baked into ClickHouse. What you need to do then, of course, is you need to then integrate this with the Kubernetes uh, 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 features. And one of the, just to give you an example of this integration, one of the things that Kubernetes does pretty well now is that it supports availability zones quite nicely. So uh, there are annotations inside uh, Kubernetes. If you set them correctly and, and use affinity rules, you can actually cause your, no, your pods to spread out nicely across availability zones. And as Vlad gave in the example, we can actually force them to particular locations. What we didn't show is those templates actually have detailed affinity rules, which 
which then push the pods to specific uh, affinity or to specific availability zones. So the key is use the, um, and this is true of any database, use the <clears throat> mechanisms for creating uh, replicas that the database has, but just then correctly configure your affinity rules so that you get them far enough away that if, if you have a failure, your replicas are outside the blast radius and aren't destroyed. Let's see. Um, checking the replication status. There are uh, system tables that allow you to do this, and this data is fed into Prometheus, and so you should be able to see the, the, the number of uh, parts awaiting replication that should be available. I don't have it in front of me. Um, Vlad, or actually Alexander Zaitsev, uh, our CTO is actually on, on the call. Do you guys have a quick answer to that, um, how we track uh, replication? Uh, status in, in Kubernetes. I assume that's available through Prometheus. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. So Twitter has a bunch, uh, provides Prometheus integration. So uh, it can export metrics from ClickHouse installations and ports to Prometheus. And there are metrics to check and track replication status as well. So Operator itself doesn't do any particular actions on that. It's responsibility of human being to decide if anything is wrong with replication, do some actions. And you can certainly configure alerts um, based on uh, certain thresholds, how you can react on when something goes wrong. Great, thank you very much. And Alexander, by the way, um, just joined this talk uh, and to, to, to see how we did. He was the one who cooked up this whole idea of, of using the operator and uh, and has been sort of, you know, behind the scenes helping to drive this whole uh, 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 question. I'll just review a couple of um, questions that came up and were answered uh, live. One was data placement work only on Amazon, or do you have the same t uh, template uh, for GCP? And the answer that Vlad gave is, in general, the templates are cloud agnostic. So particularly for data placement, anything that's built into native Kubernetes, like support for zones, uh, you can just use it, and so you can write affinity rules where uh, the one thing you have to do is obviously change the names of the zones, but generally speaking, these approaches work the same in, in each area. There are differences, um, um, of course, between cloud providers. Uh, if you go and look at the annotations for things like services, what makes a service internal versus, um, versus external, those annotations tend to be specific to particular providers. So you, you have to check the documentation, play around with it. We, um, <clears throat> we, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of examples of that. There was a question here, is ClickHouse available as a pass offering on cloud providers, um, or is it designed to be run only on Kubernetes? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Um, the, we, are, we actually do have a, um, a pass that we're working on right now. If you're interested in that, feel free to, to check in with us. It's not, it's not public. But just in general, I think the, like a lot of other people, one of the really great things about Kubernetes is it gives you the ability to run everywhere. So this is not just the, the longer term vision of Kubernetes overall, not just data warehouse, is that you'll be able to build services for managing data, for managing applications, where users can just decide where they want to use them. It's anywhere you've got a Kubernetes uh, cluster, you can run these services. And we're very much in line with that model. So we expect to, and, and we have customers who run this both in the cloud as well as on-prem. On and we've seen a lot of community usage in both places as well. So uh, Valerie, I believe we're at the top of the hour. We've even gone a little over. So um, I don't see any more open questions. So um, we can probably close it down. Thank you so much for sponsoring us today. It's been a pleasure to, and, and an honor to present in front of people in the CNCF. And if you have feedback, uh, here's our emails. Please do contact us. We'd love to, we'd love to hear what you think about this. Thanks, Robert and Vlad, for the great presentation. So since we've cleared all the questions, uh, the webinar recording and the slides will be online later today. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and we hope to see you in a future CNCF webinar.